This podcast is made possible by our supporters on Patreon, who pledge an amount to contribute every month and in return get exclusive access to bonus content, merchandise discounts, and much more. If you'd like to join our family, please go to patreon.com slash Gotham Variety and subscribe. That's P-A-T-R-E-O-N slash Gotham Variety. Greetings and welcome to Gotham Hardball on Gotham Variety. My name is Joe Rubenstein and it is Tuesday, April 7th and the Yankees are hunkered down in various locations, as am I, as are you, during this coronavirus outbreak and the really unprecedented shutdown of our economy, of our entire way of life. Healthcare workers are making just incredible sacrifices here in New York and all over the country, risking their lives in the call of duty. A lot of businesses on the brink or already gone under Millions suddenly jobless, including yours truly. I mean, the implications of what's going on right now will be felt for years to come. I mean, books will be written about this. But I do think that we should give ourselves permission to take a break now and then and talk about other things as well, if only in the name of mental health. So in that spirit, today, we take a deep look at a towering figure in American sporting life, a Hall of Famer and Yankee legend who waged his own battle with serious illness with a level of courage that continues to inspire to this very day, Lou Gehrig, right after this. You can follow us on Twitter, at Gotham Variety, like us on Facebook, subscribe to our show on Apple Podcasts or Stitcher. We're on Spotify as well. Check out our website at GothamVariety.com, where you can send us your comments and questions. And if you love what we're doing, we'd love a five-star review on the podcast platform of your choice. Reviews and ratings help keep our show on the charts, so more and more people can find us. We are joined this week on Gotham Hardball by a very special guest. Jonathan Eig, author of Luckiest Man, which the Chicago Sun-Times called The Definitive Life of Lou Gehrig. Jonathan, it's great to have you with us today. How are you? I'm great. Thank you. Now, before we dive into the content of Luckiest Man, I'm wondering what it was that drew you to Gehrig in particular and inspired you to write this book. I was a huge Yankee fan as a kid, and you know my hero was Bobby Mercer, but you know any Yankee fan growing up in any era knows the... Uh, the Mount Rushmore Yankees, Babe Ruth, and Lou Gehrig, Jackie, I mean, <laughs> I almost said Jackie Robinson, um, Joe DiMaggio, Mickey Mantle. Um, and and it, it didn't occur to me, you know, as a kid, Gehrig was kind of the most boring of those. Um, but when I got a little older, you know, I was in my late 30s, around the same age that Gehrig was when he died. It occurred to me that um, I had kind of not really appreciated just what a tragedy his story was. And um, at the same time, I was reading Seabiscuit, and I really appreciated how great a sports book can be when it's about something bigger than sports. And Lou Gehrig's story was really about much more than baseball. It was about a man discovering that he was dying um, in his prime and, and how he faced that tragedy. And, and it struck me that it would make a great book if, if there hadn't already been a great Gehrig biography at that point. Now, Gehrig's household growing up was dominated by his mother, Christina, very strong personality, and perhaps shaping her intensely close relationship with her son. As you put it, Gehrig was the subject of a crushing degree of attention, unquote, was the fact that Christina lost three children in their infancy, not unusual in those early years of the 20th century, especially among the disadvantaged, which the Gehrigs were, Talk about that relationship between Gehrig and his mother in those early years and how the intensity and closeness of that relationship really extended well into Gehrig's young adulthood. I say in the book that if uh, there were a Hall of Fame for Mama's Boys, Gehrig would have been elected in the first class. He was so, so um, in love with his mom and so wrapped around her finger Gehrig's father was was kind of a drunk and didn't uh, do a lot around the house and didn't um, wasn't the kind of presence that uh, that his mother was. So Gehrig became even more attached to his mother for that reason, and I think that he had a very hard time outgrowing that. Even as a as an adult, he was um, still always worried about uh, upsetting his mother. He was um, really, you know, not really ready for adulthood in many ways. He um, 
when he, when he went to college, he decided to go to the college where his mother worked as a cleaning lady. You know, he could have gone anywhere and escaped from home and gotten a little bit of independence, but he really, he didn't want it. He wasn't sure what to do. Um, and, and even into his late 20s, you know, when he's this handsome, eligible bachelor, um, superstar baseball player, he's still going home, living with his parents and going home for dinner every night and not not partying with the with the guys on the team. So he, he had serious issues when it came to his mom. Now, Garrick's athleticism and sheer physical strength were apparent from an early age. He was a star at Commerce High School here in New York, not just in baseball, but football as well, excelled at Columbia, where, as you said, his mother was a cook and housekeeper. But around that time in college, he was discovered by the legendary Yankee scout Paul Critchell. And so Gehrig was signed in 1923, started to get real playing time in 25, and then his breakout season was 26. But talk about the Yankees' team culture at that time, dominated by Babe Ruth of course, and how Gehrig did adjusting to that culture those first few years. It was really difficult for Gehrig. Even in college, he didn't get a chance to really grow up. He continued to live with his parents and hung around with his mother uh, more than he hung around with his with his teammates on the football squad or the baseball team in, in, at Columbia. And then he joins the Yankees, and in, in, it's the Roaring Twenties. It's, it's a wild time to be in New York. He's this handsome, eligible bachelor, Babe Ruth is having more fun than anybody <laughs> alive. And Gehrig could be his running mate. You know, Gehrig could be out there every night having a blast. And, and he just didn't know what to do with himself. He didn't fit in at all. And he was embarrassed. You know, he, he went down for his first spring training uh, with, you know, just a couple bucks in his pocket and was afraid to, to eat out with the other guys. Um, really didn't know how to how to be around women. Uh, even, you know, the movies were, were more than he could handle. He would just go home and read books at night. So he, he didn't fit in at all. And I think if it weren't for his amazing abilities on the field, uh, he would have been mocked, you know, he, he would have been mocked even more than he was. He was mocked a little bit. Now, first baseman Wally Pipp got a raw deal, it turns out, from historians. He was actually a really good player. But the legend that was repeated for decades was that Wally Pipp had the most unfortunate headache in the history of sports on June 2nd, 1925, that he told manager Miller Huggins that he couldn't play. Huggins put Gehrig in at first, exit Wally Pipp. That's the legend, but what actually happened there? The real story is that the Yankees were slumping, and Miller Huggins was looking to shake up the team a little bit, looking to uh, maybe send a message to the starters who were lollygagging, and, and also just to give some of the young players a shot. He had Gehrig sitting on the bench, you know, this this big, strong kid, and Wally Pipp was really struggling, and he was starting to wind down. His career was nearing its end. So he decided to put Gehrig in, and he shook up the lineup that day, and, and Gehrig had a great game. And um, it was obvious that, that, that this kid had talent, and, and, and it just there was no chance for Pipp to get back in the lineup. Now, if you know, the, we we now say someone's pipped if they're uh, if they take a day off and they're replaced. But in fact, you know, he was Gehrig. Pip was, Pip was Gehrig, I think, because he was replaced by a better, younger uh, alternative, and that's just uh, the way it tends to work. There's nothing unusual about it. Now, one thing you make very clear is that Gehrig's famous streak of 2,130 consecutive games played was no accident. It was a conscious decision on Gehrig's part early on, really just to play every day. And this was certainly true later of Cal Ripken as well. But I got the feeling reading your book, Jonathan, that Gehrig, on some level, knew that he would always be overshadowed by Ruth as a player, and even more by the force of Ruth's really superabundant charisma. But I got the feeling that Gehrig understood that an area where he could beat Ruth was this area of determination, grit, whatever you want to call it, uh, showing up and doing the job day after day, no matter what. And Gehrig, a number of times, uh, played with injuries that would put a player today on the injured list in a heartbeat. But talk about the streak and what it meant to Lou Gehrig. Gehrig absolutely knew that this was something that Babe Ruth couldn't do. And Gehrig had that you know German background, that that 
sense of hard work that his mother had, had given him. Um, he, he really became a great baseball player, not because he was the most naturally gifted. Um, in fact, he was a clumsy um, fielder. He had to really work hard to, to learn to be a competent first baseman. And he always believed that his greatest gift was, was his determination not his natural ability. So playing every day very much fit into that personality, into that character, and into what he felt were his strengths. And, you know, he absolutely knew he had this streak. He absolutely knew it was something that Babe Ruth could never match. Ruth was always taking time off for belly aches or for, you know, STDs. And uh, Gehrig was really proud of the fact that he was in the lineup every day. And in fact, you know, he kept a box score in his wallet pretty much his whole life. Uh, from his first game in, in, in when he began that streak. And it wasn't the uh, the day that he replaced Wally Pipp. It was actually the day before when he pinch hit. So he would often remind people that the streak was actually one day longer than they thought because he was in the lineup uh, as a pinch hitter the day before he replaced Wally Pipp. Interesting. Now, the streak was not without its controversies. There were games when Gehrig was really hurting when he was initially in the lineup, but then removed by Joe McCarthy after an inning or so. In fact, there was at least one game, you point out, where he was really banged up and he just played the defensive top of the first and never even came to bat. And there were grumbles from Babe Ruth. Now, that may have been sour grapes. This was after he and Gehrig had their falling out, which we'll get to. But others, too, reporters, fans that the streak was not a good idea, that ultimately it might wear him down and shorten his career. But talk about some of the media and fan reaction to the streak while it was happening. You know, it was ignored really for the first, I don't know, almost the first thousand games. It didn't get that much attention. Then when he began passing others who had uh, set the record, people began commenting on it. And there was a little bit of grumbling. You know, he um, came out early or he only played an inning on days that he wasn't feeling well to keep the streak alive. But, you know, the same, they said the same thing about Cal Ripken, for that matter. And they also complained that maybe he was hurting the team, that, that he'd be better off if he rested a little bit. But, um, you know, these are unknowns, and it's just kind of the thing that reporters like to, like to hash out because it's, it's fun to speculate. But um, Gehrig said, you know, he felt like he was more good to the team in the lineup, even if he wasn't uh, at his best. And um, he couldn't help the team at all if he was sitting on the bench. And he just that was just his nature. He had to be in there, he felt like. Now, the relationship between Ruth and Gehrig had its twists and turns. Uh, during those initial few years, I'm paraphrasing, but I think the way you put it was Gehrig admired Ruth and Ruth liked being admired. Now, Ruth and Gehrig were sort of forced together even after some of those seasons had ended by barnstorming tours, exhibition games. Talk about that friendship, if you want to call it that, and where it took a turn for the worse. I think they liked each other. I think they recognized that they were not exactly soulmates, that, uh, but, but that kind of made the relationship more interesting. Um, you know, of course, Babe Ruth was an orphan, and he, he liked, or he, well, he was raised in this orphanage, and, uh, and he liked the fact that he could go home to, to, to Gehrig's parents for these big, fat, you know, heavy meals and, and be treated like a, like a kid and be served um, dinner around the table. Um, he, you know, he, he, he saw Gehrig as a, as a little brother, somebody who needed help, needed to be taught the ways of the world, and, and tried to um, introduce him to women, tried to introduce him to a slightly faster life. And, and Gehrig really looked up to the babe because babe was, uh, everybody was, you know, babe was everybody's hero. And certainly as a kid, Gehrig uh, thought babe was the greatest player he'd ever seen. And I think that uh, they had a, a nice kind of big brother, little brother relationship for a long time. And the barnstorming was a, was a great way for them to, to cement that they got to know each other on the road for, you know, weeks at a time at the end of the season. And, and it really, um, I think lasted quite a while until, until Gehrig met his wife, and then things got more complicated. Well, do you want to get into that? Sure. Um, so Eleanor Twitchell um, was what they called a circuit girl. She hung around when the Yankees came to town and went to the parties with the ball players, and, and that suggests that you were living in the fast lane. Um, nobody knows for sure whether Eleanor uh, ever slept with the Yankees when they came to town, but uh, if you went to those parties, there was a pretty good chance that, uh, you know, you might go home with one of the ball players, and and she certainly could have slept with Babe Ruth. And when she met Gehrig at this party, Gehrig just fell in love with her and said, "I'm going to marry this girl." And he did. You know, he started sending her like ridiculously expensive gifts before they'd even gone on a date. He was he was wooing her and planning to sweep her off her feet. And when they uh, when they did finally go on a date, and when he proposed marriage, 
Um, she was a, a little surprised that it was happening so quickly, but she was she was up for it. The only problem was that Gehrig's mother was opposed. Gehrig's mother was opposed to any girl who might steal her her Louis away from her. But um, Ma Gehrig was particularly concerned about Eleanor because she had this reputation of being a circuit girl, and she is. I think Ma Gehrig assumed that Eleanor had slept with the babe, and and Eleanor may have slept with the babe. So that really tainted the relationship for, for Ma Gehrig and led to all kinds of problems with that. You know, Gehrig thought that when they got married, they'd come, they'd go and live with his parents. And, and Eleanor said, no, absolutely not. But then something happened on the honeymoon. Um, they postponed their honeymoon a little bit until um, this barnstorming trip to Japan. And Eleanor uh, went along on this trip with Lou. And at one point on the boat, um, Eleanor disappeared. Lou couldn't find her anywhere. He was really scared. He thought maybe she'd fallen overboard. He, she was looking all over. He was looking all over for her. And then finally found her in the babe's cabin with uh, the babe and his wife, drunk, lying on babe's bed. Um, we don't know if she was clothed or not clothed. We don't know uh, whether there was more than drinking going on. Eleanor admitted that, that she was in the room. Um, she, she wrote in her own memoir that, that Lou discovered her and that that was the end of the friendship between Lou and the babe, that Lou felt he had been betrayed um, by the babe, not necessarily by, by his new wife. Um, but after that, the friendship really um, ruptured, and you can even see it on the field. Prior to that moment, you know, whenever Babe Ruth hit a home run, Lou Gehrig was there to greet him, and he crossed the plate and to shake his hand. And if you just look at the, at the film clips of the home runs, after that moment, Lou does not reach out to shake Babe's hand. He turns his back when the Babe crosses the plate. I never knew that. That's fascinating. I mean, I almost got the feeling reading your book that given how shy Gehrig was, almost pathologically so, that this dynamic of being constantly overshadowed by Ruth was kind of a double-edged sword in that, you know, on the one hand, it had to be frustrating, but... Gehrig was never one to seek attention. In fact, it mortified him. So do you think there was a bit of relief as well that the spotlight focused more on Ruth than him? I do think that Lou liked being in the babe's shadow. It took a lot of pressure off of him. If he were um, the star of a team in, in a small town, he probably could have handled it and might have even enjoyed it. But to be the star of a team in New York or to even try to compete with the babe for attention was was out of the question for Lou. So I think he... He felt a great sense of relief, and, and he was almost pathological in his shyness. Lou didn't even like signing autographs. He didn't even like the attention from kids. He he never wrote um, a book in the off-season the way Babe did for extra money. He was not interested in talking about himself. He, he gave very few interviews to the reporters, and when he did give interviews, he tended to really stick to the superficial uh, didn't want people prying into his into his personal life. He was um, he was a strange guy in that way. Now the 1927 team, the greatest in baseball history, was truly a machine. That's not breaking any news. And and Gehrig's 27 season is generally regarded as his best. His OPS that season was an ungodly 1240. That's a career high. Although typically Ruth overshadowed even that with a 1258 OPS on the strength of those 60 home runs. But Gehrig actually got the better of Ruth in RBIs by eight, which is astounding when you consider the fact that he hit after Ruth. So, so he came to bat 60 plus times with the bases empty. He also had more hits than Ruth. And so while there's certainly a case to be made that the 27 season was Gehrig's best, uh, there were other seasons that can stand right beside it. I mean, 1930, he hit 379. That's a career high. 1931, he had 185 RBIs. That remains an American League record. Talk about Gehrig's 27 season and where it ranks in his career. It's really hard to say. 27 was obviously an insane season, and, and, and you point out correctly that it's even more insane that he drives in all those runs with, with Ruth clearing the bases 60 times um, in front of him. I, I still can't quite figure out how he drove in all those runs, but I think you know you can make the case that, that Gehrig is the greatest hitter of all time when you look at those numbers. And if you think about what would have happened if he hadn't gotten sick and, and played you know, another four or five seasons at the level he was playing or even close, you know, I, I, if, even if you factor in for the normal kind of fall off that you get with age, um, I think he'd be remembered right up there with 
Ted Williams and Babe Ruth as, as one of the all-time greatest hitters. Now, we touched on Eleanor before, who had a profound impact on Gehrig's life during their eight years together. They married in 1933, and you go into quite a bit of detail on her background and personality, very different from Gehrig on both counts. Talk about what that relationship meant to Gehrig's evolution as a human being. Eleanor really helped him grow up. You know, she insisted that he stop and sign autographs. Gehrig used to sneak in to the stadium. He would avoid the player's entrance just so that he didn't have to sign autographs. And Eleanor said, no, you're a star. These kids look up to you. You have to go through the player's entrance and you have to sign autographs. And she insisted that he stop just um, accepting whatever contract the Yankees sent him every year. She said, you know, you, you should negotiate. You're the star of this team. You deserve more money. She hired a publicist for him, the same one who, who worked with Babe Ruth. She um, helped him get an audition for, for a Hollywood movie to play the role of Tarzan, uh, which, which he didn't get because he was actually too muscular. So Eleanor really helped him. She, she took him into the city and, and, and exposed him to, to opera and, and theater. And I think it was uh, hugely important for, for his development as a, as a person. He began to really take a little bit of uh, pleasure in life. It wasn't all about baseball. It wasn't all about hard work. And, and he was able to break free a little bit from his mother, thanks to Eleanor. Now, Gehrig's first manager was Miller Huggins. But for most of his career, it was Joe McCarthy. And they became very close. McCarthy who spoke with great emotion at Lou Gehrig Day in 1939, was absolutely devastated by Gehrig's illness and death. Uh, He had appointed Gehrig captain in 1935. That was a role that Gehrig took very seriously. Talk about McCarthy and why those two got along so well, and also how the team culture changed as the Yankees transitioned from that swashbuckling 20s group led by Ruth into the Depression-era group led by Gehrig and then ultimately DiMaggio. Lou always really liked authority figures, and um, you know, I think almost any manager would have been like a father figure to him. And uh, Joe McCarthy was a perfect one in many ways because McCarthy loved rules and loved operating with a set of principles. And he was a great leader, and the, the, I think the players all really liked him. But he sort of adopted Lou and tried to teach Lou to think of himself as a leader, um, especially with, with Babe fading and leaving. Uh, Gehrig really becomes the captain and, and the spiritual leader of the team. And he, and he sets a much more serious tone than, than Babe Ruth, of course. You know, And it's really the image that the Yankees would carry forth for generations, you know, this business-like approach to the game. You know, now the Yankees are, you know, they don't let you wear long hair or mustache or beard, right? But but Gehrig is really the first, um, he's this strong, silent kind of a captain and, and makes the Yankees into this kind of a, a more serious bunch than they ever could have been with Babe Ruth around. And I think that's um, something that DiMaggio talked about a lot, that Gehrig was really a quiet leader, but he led very effectively by by setting an example. Now, your book goes into really unprecedented detail about those last years of Gehrig's life and his struggle with ALS, a rare disease, thankfully, but Gehrig began to experience symptoms during the 1938 season, weakness, fatigue, falling down on the base paths, uh, routine putouts at first base all of a sudden weren't so routine. Talk about that initial phase of Gehrig's illness, Jonathan, and how he became a patient at the world-famous Mayo Clinic in Minnesota. When Gehrig showed up for spring training in 1938, he began to complain that he didn't feel right, that he was getting blisters on his hands, he was tripping, um, he, w- he went golfing one day, and just felt like his feet weren't coming up. He was he was like kicking the grass. He was tripping over curbs. And he starts constantly dropping down to a lighter bat as the season moves through. And, you know, it's as if he knows something's happening to his body, but he doesn't know what it is. And, you know, some of the reporters think, well, he's just getting old. Some of them say it's because he's never taken a day off and the fatigue is setting in and maybe it's hitting him all at once. And by the end of the season, you know, his numbers are down dramatically. I think he still hit like 295 and 29 home runs, drove in 114 RBIs. Um, and, and so he still had what most people would consider a fantastic season. But for Gehrig, it was way off of his of his usual. And uh, it, it's clear now that, that something was wrong. In the offseason, he did go to a doctor. Um, he went to just a sort of a general practitioner. And the doctor didn't see anything wrong with him, told him to try changing his diet and he came back in the for spring training, and and now everybody could see something was wrong. He you know he'd lost a ton of weight, and if you look at pictures from the 
from spring training in 1939. It's shocking, really, how he, he doesn't even fit his uniform anymore. And he was playing so badly that, that it was embarrassing to him and to everybody in the press. Um, you know, he was dropping easy throws. He was having trouble getting out of the way of inside pitches. He had, couldn't hit for power at all. Everybody was talking about it. What's wrong with Gehrig? What's happened to him? Why does he look so terrible? But um, he still tried to stay in the lineup. He thought maybe it was a virus and he'd shake it off. He didn't want to lose that streak of his. So he kept playing and pushing through it. He did take a couple games off during spring training, which for, for Lou was unusual. But when the season started, he was in the lineup. He played the first few games. And then finally, you know, he became concerned that he was really hurting the team. There was a routine play at first base that he couldn't make. He had to, and everybody con- kind of congratulated him when he, when he managed to somehow get back to the bag in time for the put out. But, but he knew that, that it should have been an easy play. And then finally, he took himself out of the lineup and agreed to go see some doctors at the Mayo Clinic. And that was it. They, uh, they, they diagnosed him instantly. They, the doctors could see right, right away what was happening to him. But there was a good deal of trouble in how this diagnosis was disseminated to the media and the public. And the resulting confusion created real problems for Garrick during a very vulnerable period. Uh, you describe an article published in 1940, which implied that Garrick may have infected his teammates who were playing poorly at the time. This is, of course, impossible. It's not a communicable disease. Uh, Garrick sued that publication for libel, by the way. I can't help but wonder if the facts had been more clearly laid out to the public that maybe that article never gets written. So before we get to what Gehrig himself may have been told about his illness, which is a whole other story, talk about what the media and the public were told at that time. When Gehrig was diagnosed at the Mayo Clinic, they sent him back with a letter that said he had ALS, amyotrophic lateral sclerosis, and they compared it. They said it was a form of poliomyelitis. And when people saw polio, they thought, oh, it's like polio. You know, it's, uh, it, it could be contagious. So people misunderstood. And as a result of that, not only did they think that it was potentially contagious, they also thought that it was not fatal because, you know, a lot of people survive polio and you just, you know, you might need braces on your legs or you might need a wheelchair. So it created a lot of confusion and misunderstanding. I think even those people who were there when Garrett gave his farewell speech and heard him say, you know, I'm the luckiest man on the face of the earth. Even then, people didn't really know for sure that he was dying. They thought maybe this was just his way of saying goodbye to baseball, that he was never going to play again. Um, So it was, there was a lot of confusion about it. And and it wasn't all the media's fault. You know, ALS was, was just completely unknown at that time. It was such a rare disease. But it was certainly known to the neurological community at that time, and they knew the ultimate outcome. Now, there were about 200 letters between Gehrig and Dr. Paul O'Leary, who was Gehrig's primary physician at the clinic. And I got to be honest, Jonathan, as I read some of what O'Leary wrote to Gehrig about his prognosis, I found myself getting a little angry on Gehrig's behalf. You know, Gehrig in his letters was practically begging for candor about his outlook. I'll quote one here. This is about a year and a half before his death, writing to O'Leary, quote, Please don't judge me a crybaby or believe me to be losing my guts. But as always, I would like to know the actual truth and not continue to receive encouraging reports which have little or no chance of materializing, or to continue to live in false hopes. There is definitely something going on within my body which I do not understand, and which I would appreciate immensely if you would discuss with Dr. Woltman, and please, that word's in all caps, please reveal to me your honest opinions, unquote. And here's O'Leary writing back, quote, I know by innuendos you have the impression that people do not arrest the progress of ALS. You remember in our last talk, I tried to emphasize the point that you would probably progress to a certain degree, following which you would either remain stationary with some residual signs like numbness in your fingertips and difficulty walking, or that there would be an improvement in many of these temporary inconveniences. And O'Leary goes on here at the end, quote, Courage and persistence in treatment invariably result in an arrest of the process such as you have, unquote. Which, you know, O'Leary, who was a well-credentialed physician at a first-rate facility, but he certainly knew those words were false, Jonathan. So I wonder if unintentionally he made a horrendous situation even worse for Gehrig by adding this element of false hope or even guilt on Gehrig's part. You know, Gehrig, he was always so worried about letting people down, so maybe guilt 
that his condition was not improving. But what's your take, Jonathan, on this whole issue of candor between Gehrig and his doctors? And I use the plural because he saw a number of them in both Minnesota and New York. It is disconcerting, and and, um, it's hard to know exactly what to make of it. You know, I can understand why they'd want to keep his hopes up and to keep his spirits up and not tell him that that this was hopeless. And and in fact, Eleanor was writing to Dr. O'Leary and asking him to do just that. Eleanor was was saying, we must continue to, to give him hope. And I don't know that that was such a good thing. I mean, a lot of patients go through that. They they give themselves false hope. They you know they find some crazy new potential cure. They fly off to some foreign country to try some new experimental drug. And you know it's common for for people to seek some kind of a um, a way to avoid the the notion that that, that they're doomed. Um, but to deliberately mislead the way O'Leary did, I think is wrong. And I, I know that other doctors there, when D- Gehrig was diagnosed, I know that they told him that ALS was fatal. But nevertheless, O'Leary is, is creating the strong impression that, that, th- that those doctors may have been wrong, that there is a chance here. And it, it, as, you, as you read there, he says, invariably, this disease can be arrested. I mean, that's just a flat out lie. Now, did those other doctors you mentioned tell him it was fatal or that it was just incurable? Because Garrick wrote a letter uh, from the Mayo Clinic to Eleanor, which says something like, you know, it's likely that I'll need to walk with a cane in 10 to 15 years, but I won't be able to play ball again, which does not sound like a realistic assessment of what was about to happen. So do you think that Garrick, in fact, knew that his illness was fatal or just that it was incurable? We don't know. He may have been writing that to Eleanor to try to let her down a little easier, too. But the doctors who I talked to who, were, who worked with those doctors at the Mayo Clinic, I interviewed doctors who were trained by the doctors who diagnosed Gehrig. And they said these men were such professionals and so serious that they would never have intentionally misled a patient, that they would have absolutely told him that this was fatal. But very often, a patient hears what they want to hear. You know, some cases um, move more slowly than others. A patient hears that, well, we have had occasions where someone has lived with this for, you know, many, many years, even decades. And that's what the patient wants to hear because that's what they need to process this. And that may be what happened to Gehrig, but ultimately we don't really know. Okay, Lou Gehrig Day, July 4th, 1939. We all know the magnificent speech that Gehrig gave that day, one of the most moving ever delivered, in my opinion. Of course, the title of your book, Luckiest Man, derives from it. Now, something you cleared up for me that I've always wondered was whether that speech was delivered off the cuff or not. Tell us what you discovered about any preparation that may or may not have gone into that speech and any other interesting details you uncovered about that event, which is recreated just beautifully in your book. Oh, thanks. Um, We don't know for sure. Eleanor said that he had had some help from um, a writer, but there's really no way to know. The writer who Eleanor mentioned never took any credit for having contributed to the speech. And my strong feeling is that Gehrig did not have help, that he wrote it himself, that he he may have jotted some notes the night before about what he was going to say, but he really believed that he wasn't going to make a speech that day. And I think that's the most important thing to remember, that that he absolutely insisted that he was not going to speak. And he, he didn't even want to be out there on the field and beg Joe McCarthy to let him out of it. And, and when it came time to speak, he, he even said, no, 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 I'm not going to say anything. And they began to roll up the microphone wires. And, and then Joe McCarthy pushed him out there and said, come on, you got to say something. So we don't know whether Gehrig had rehearsed these words at all, whether he had thought about what to say. But again, just given his personality, my hunch is that he had thought about what, what he would say. And it, it, it's so beautiful. Um, because it feels so so unrehearsed and so unpolished, and in sometimes in some ways it's even you know like ridiculous. He thanks his opposing teams, he thanks the ushers, he thanks his mother-in-law, and and he goes on to say basically that he's lucky. No matter what kind of a diagnosis he's received, no matter that the no, never mind that his baseball career is over, he's lucky because he's had all of these wonderful things in his life. So it's not about this diagnosis. It's about the wonderful life that he's had up until this point, and, and that's why he's, he's grateful. And that, that's a beautiful sentiment, something I think that continues to inspire everybody who hears it. 
Now, it's always been a bit frustrating to me that we're able to hear the beginning and the end of that speech, but not the rest. Yeah, I'm very disappointed. There's only four sentences that survive on tape or on film, and I keep hoping that somebody's going to find one in their attic. You know, it was recorded, um, it was it was aired on the radio, and um, n- newspaper reporters, of course, were there, and there were some cameras filming it for the newsreels, for the Movie Tone News, and, and those newsreels, they edited the parts that they wanted to use to show um, in movie theaters, uh, but they shed the parts that they didn't need, and apparently nobody saved the complete footage of it, so we did not have a complete recording. I was able to piece it together as best I could from those four sentences that survive on film, plus looking at all of the different newspaper coverage of the event and trying to find sentences that matched up that were reported by multiple news outlets similarly or um, in the same way. But a lot of the newspaper reporters quoted it differently because these guys are not using tape recorders. They're just jotting it down by hand. Okay, final question, Jonathan. Some amusing facts in your epilogue about the 1942 film production Pride of the Yankees, seminal baseball film. And what I found amusing was the fact that the producer, Sam Goldwyn, as well as the star, Gary Cooper, knew basically nothing about baseball. And Goldwyn, when the film was proposed to him, called it box office poison. He said if people want baseball, they'll go to the ballpark. But tell the listeners how Goldwyn was ultimately convinced to produce that film, which turned out to be a huge box office success, and how Gary Cooper adjusted to his role in that film. Goldwyn heard Gehrig's speech. Somebody uh, played him the the film of, of Gehrig's farewell speech and was moved by that. And then he was also convinced that, you know, the, the war was on and, and a lot of American men were overseas, that, that this could work as a love story, that there might actually be a chance to get women to show up to watch this movie by making Eleanor a bigger character and by portraying this not as a baseball story, but as a tragic tale of lost love. Um, and that's really um, how they ended up selling it. That's why it has a dance scene and a musical number in there, which, you know, is not something you'd put in for baseball fans. Um, and Gary Cooper, you know, grew up on a farm, um, a strong physical actor, but but hadn't played baseball much if at all. And, and you could tell, and he, he could not, for the life of him, um, swing the bat left-handed. So that became a real problem in filming this thing. The solution that they found was to sew the number four on his the back of his uniform in reverse, let him swing right-handed, and to have him run to third base instead of to first base, and then to flip the film. And uh, if you watch carefully, you can see that the shadows in the movie are wrong. The book is called Luckiest Man. Pick it up. It's it's a gripping tale, very well told, with some remarkable photographs as well, by the way, including a few I'd never seen. Jonathan, amazing work here. Thank you so much for being part of the show. We really appreciate it. Thanks for having me. All right. We'll come back. More Gotham Hardball in just a moment. Your feedback is important to us. On Twitter, at Gotham Variety, on our Facebook page, or you can email the program, joe at gothamvariety.com. Really, however you'd like to engage with us, we love engaging with you. And if you'd like to join our family and get exclusive access to bonus content, please go to patreon.com slash gothamvariety and subscribe. And that'll do it for this week's episode of Gotham Hardball on Gotham Variety. Don't forget to check us out and subscribe on Apple, Stitcher, or Spotify so you don't miss a single episode. Thanks so much for joining us. Take care, stay safe, and we'll see you soon. Bye.